Welcome back to the Gearhead Lounge. Thanks for stopping by. This video today has been the request of many of you subscribers. Today, we're going to dive into the history of the Chrysler Hemi. Yes, the Hemi. And this is a pretty involved engine. And so to avoid it being a 90 minute or two hour long video, we've broken it up into three sections. The generation one, generation two, and generation three. Today's generation one. So sit back and relax as we dive into the history of the Chrysler Hemi. When it comes to Mopar products, you can be sure that you're going to encounter one of the most out of the box, in your face, I don't care what you like, you like this now, stuff you'll ever encounter. From engines, to suspension systems, to the overall car or truck, Chrysler products are just different. They can be polarizing. You either love them or you hate them. That's because for decades, the divisions of Chrysler, Dodge, and Plymouth have been pushing the envelope venturing into the unknown and setting new trends. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, but they're always striving to be different. Case in point, let's take a look at the Chrysler Hemi. Just saying that four letter word evokes a feeling of extreme awe for most car enthusiasts. But what is it about a piece of machinery that has spanned across the decades, ascended from a household name to a legend only to be reborn and rise to legendary status once again. The engine that has literally built and broken careers, powered the quickest drag cars on the planet, and has even been instrumental for the success and growth of many a YouTube creator. In this video, we're going to look at the very first generation of the fabled Chrysler Hemi engine. So what is a Hemi? Hey! That thing got a hammy? Yeah. Sweet. Well, I'm far from an engine guru, but I'll do my best to put it as simply as possible. The internal combustion engine as we know it utilizes what's known as a combustion chamber in order to ignite the air fuel mixture and house the valve openings in the cylinder head. Combustion chambers come in many shapes, including wedge, bathtub, pent roof, and hemisphere. It's the hemisphere that we're going to look at. As you can probably tell, the Hemi gets its name from the combustion chamber being in the shape of a hemisphere. It's officially called a hemispherical combustion chamber, but Chrysler trademarked the name Hemi during the second generation of this engine. Its major advantages come from valve size, valve placement, and a centrally located spark plug. During engine operation, it's the igniting of the air fuel mixture that generates the power. As the piston reaches the top of the cylinder, the spark plug ignites the mixture just in time for the expanding flame front to meet the piston just as it begins its down motion and push the piston down the bore. Ideally, placing the spark plug in a central location provides the best conditions for combustion. The flame front burns evenly all around the cylinder which is preferred. Many other combustion chamber designs place a spark plug on the edge of the cylinder, causing a flame front that travels across the cylinder, which are in a large percentage of what we drive today. Believe it or not, the Hemi engine isn't exclusive to Chrysler products. Hemi engines have been around for well over 100 years. Now details are kind of sketchy, but I believe that Alan R. Welch is credited for being the first to fully utilize a hemispherical combustion chamber in an internal combustion engine. Not that he invented it, but in 1908, he made the best use of it. Welch's engine came in the form of a 5.5 liter overhead cam inline four that made 50 horsepower. Other auto manufacturers around that time to produce a Hemi engine were BMW and Peugeot, which was actually more of a pent roof design than Hemi. Another area where the Hemi was mass produced was in aviation. One of the largest manufacturers was Pratt & Whitney, 
who utilized the Hemi design in the radial engines they produced not only for World War II fighter planes, but other aircraft as well. Now this is where Chrysler enters the story, on the aviation side. Before World War II, the United States began the task of modernizing their military. For their airplanes, most engines were of the radial design. While they were good at producing power, they limited the top speed of the airplane due to the engine protruding into the air as it traveled over the fuselage, producing drag. In 1941, Chrysler entered into a contract with the American military to develop a 2,000 horsepower engine in a V configuration. What they came up with was a monster of an engine. They developed the Chrysler 42220. Now before I go any further, the name of this engine uses Roman numerals. I could say IV2220, but it just doesn't sound right. I believe it should be pronounced as the Roman numerals are saying. So they produced the Chrysler 42220 that evolved into the Chrysler 142220 and finally the 112220. It was a massive V16 engine that set the cylinder banks at a 60 degree angle, as opposed to the more popular 90 degree configuration of most of our production V8 engines today. The V configuration takes up less frontal area, thus making the airplane more aerodynamic. The engine block is separated into two V8 sections with the propeller reduction gear mounted in between. Each of the 16 cylinders featured its own forged steel barrel sleeve that was topped by individual aluminum cylinder heads, each of which were built using hemispherical combustion chambers with twin spark plugs and overhead cams. The engine in its testing configuration was fed by a General Electric turbocharger that was referred to as a turbo supercharger at the time. I've seen many articles stating that the engine is both turbocharged and supercharged, and while that's definitely possible to do, I don't think that's the actual setup in this case. That's because while turbos and blowers were definitely around at that time, I don't believe the nomenclature agrees with what we see today. You see, whether it's a turbo, a blower, or nitrous, it's all known as supercharging. The term supercharging is defined as forcing the intake charge into the cylinders under pressure, which is what both a blower and turbo do very well. The difference between a blower and a turbo is that a blower is crank driven while a turbo is exhaust driven. They both supercharge, but if you tell your buddy that your new car is supercharged, chances are it's gonna have a blower under the hood. Thus, the term supercharger stuck with the blowers if your car is turbocharged, then it's gonna have a turbo. If you look up the GE Turbo Supercharger, you'll see that it was 100% exhaust driven. Plus, a turbo would be way more reliable in this application. I mean, the last thing a fighter pilot needs to do is toss a blower belt in the middle of a dogfight. The turbocharged setup featured an intercooler as well as an aftercooler, and the entire setup displaced 2,220 cubic inches, or 36.3 liters, producing 2,500 horsepower in its testing configuration. The engine was mounted upside down and was narrow enough to fit within a 33 and a half inch diameter circle, which greatly reduced frontal area, but at over 10 feet long, required that the sheet metal on the experimental P-47 to be completely redesigned. The experimental plane was known as the XP-47H. The new nose was longer and narrower than a regular P-47, thus making it much sleeker as it cut through the air. There's a debate over whether the XP-47H was actually faster than the P-47, as there are two conflicting stories. I'm inclined to believe that the engine was extremely successful, otherwise it wouldn't have kept developing it. But in the end, World War II was over at this time, and everyone started getting into jets, so the 112220 literally died on the vine. But that wasn't the end of the Hemi engine for Chrysler. In fact, it was just the beginning. With the success of the 112220, Chrysler began to pursue the use of a Hemi engine for production cars. Like we said before, Chrysler wasn't the only company building engines with hemispherical combustion chambers. One such company was Ardun, 
ran by the very well-known Zoroarchus Duntoff and his brother. Arjun developed a top-end kit for the seriously choked out Ford Flathead engine. They featured cylinder heads with hemispherical combustion chambers that helped them achieve horsepower numbers in the 300 range. To find out more about the history of Zora Arcus Duntoff, click on this link in the upper right hand corner. Being that Duntoff's cylinder head design was developed a few years before Chrysler came out with their street version, many mistakenly believe Chrysler got their Hemi idea from Duntoff. But as you can see, Chrysler's been working at this for a while, so no. It wasn't done tough. While developing the airplane engine, Chrysler simultaneously focused their efforts on developing product for consumers. One of the areas of development was in the engine department. Chrysler's engine development department was tasked to test every engine combination they could find or think of. Their goal was to find the best possible combination that could be used in their production vehicles but still remain cost efficient. They tested all kinds of combinations, but one combination stood out in particular and that featured an overhead valve configuration and hemispherical combustion chambers. They began testing it on a single cylinder engine and found that the hemispherical head demonstrated better volumetric efficiency, meaning that it breathed much better resisted detonation, and made more power with a 7 to 1 compression ratio than others could do with a 10 to 1 compression ratio. The next step was to utilize the same configuration on a production Chrysler engine. Heading up this project was James Zeter, younger brother of Fred Zeter, who was instrumental in the formation of Chrysler itself back in the day. James took a production flathead six-cylinder and installed the Hemi head with a dual overhead cam setup. It was found that not only did the engine make more power, but it was actually smoother and quieter. Now you would think that Chrysler would take that news and completely revamp their engine line, but they didn't, mainly because of the sales failure of the DeSoto Airflow. While I won't go into details, it made Chrysler reluctant to pursue new technologies or take unnecessary risks. In translation, Chrysler's business philosophy was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. At this time, 1943, Chrysler had yet to produce a V8 engine. In fact, they were so against utilizing new technology that when James Zeter made his proposal to Chrysler execs to produce these new V8 engines, he was opposed by his own brother, Fred, who said that Chrysler had made its money on straight engines, signaling that there was no way that Chrysler would make the move to V8 engines. However, the engine development department persisted, which led to a few heated arguments within Chrysler every time the subject was brought up. Finally, in 1948, Top Brass relented and allowed development of a prototype 330 cubic inch V8 with hemi-cylinder heads, the A182. After some research and development, Chrysler gave the go-ahead for production. They then developed the A239, a 331 cubic inch prototype that would be geared towards production. Chrysler head of development William Drinkard specified that he wanted a 100,000 mile engine. No major parts such as pistons, rings, and bearings were to fail before that point. Chrysler engineers worked feverishly developing an engine that would last the desired duration. The board measured 3.81 inches and stroke was 3.63 inches, making the overall displacement 331 cubic inches, generating 180 horsepower and 312 pound-feet of torque. The key to any engine with hemispherical combustion chambers is, of course, the cylinder head design. Having the valves on opposite sides required a creative pushrod and rocker arm geometry, which became the trademark for the Hemi. This staggered setup featured a short rocker for the intake valves and a long rocker for the exhaust. With the spark plugs being centrally located, spark plug access was a definite concern. Their position placed them directly under the valve cover, which asked the question of how they would be able to route the ignition wires and how would anyone be able to change spark plugs without removing the valve covers. 
Engineers developed a unique valve cover with holes over each spark plug. A tube ran from the top of the valve cover down to the spark plug opening, sealed with rubber O-rings to prevent oil leaks. The ignition wires were built with an extended plug boot that could reach all the way down to the spark plug and seal itself to the valve cover. A trim plate was placed on top and the wires were routed out the rear to a dual point distributor. After more than 8,000 hours and over half a million miles of testing, Chrysler was satisfied with their creation and named it the Chrysler Firepower. The new Firepower was introduced in the fall of 1950 for their 1951 model line. It was the standard engine for the New Yorker and the Imperial, while being an option in their Saratoga. With Chrysler's Firepower making headlines for the 51 model year, DeSoto and Dodge wanted a piece of the action and ended up developing hemi-headed engines of their own. The weird thing about this engine development is that one would think that Chrysler would simply take their current engine design and rebadge them for the other divisions, but no. DeSoto and Dodge would develop their own designs that are similar enough to look alike, but unique enough to have practically zero parts in common. Starting with the original, Chrysler introduced the Firepower engine in late 1950 for their 1951 model year line, operating with a 7 to 1 compression ratio and topped off with a two barrel carburetor, the Firepower produced 180 horsepower and 312 pound feet of torque. Chrysler enjoyed this exclusivity for a whole year. DeSoto was the first in 1952 to develop their own Hemi and introduce the world to the DeSoto Fire Dome, a slick little Hemi V8 with a 3.6 inch bore and 3.3 inch stroke measuring 276 cubic inches. Sporting a 7.5 to 1 compression ratio, the Fire Dome produced 160 horsepower and 250 pound feet of torque through a two barrel carburetor. It was introduced in a DeSoto car that shared the same name as the engine. Dodge finished off the trio in 1953 with the Red Ram, the smallest production Hemi of the three. With a bore of 3.44 inches and a stroke of 3.25, the Red Ram came in at 241 cubes, producing 140 horsepower and 220 pound-feet of torque, and was only available in the 1953 Dodge Coronet. Between all three engines, naturally, competition set in and all three engines grew in size and power from 1953 to 1959, with Dodge peaking at 315 cubic inches, DeSoto at 345, and Chrysler at 392. But the engine size isn't really the story here. The real story is how these engines got here and how the Hemi survived, thanks to James Zeter, Fred's brother. I mentioned James earlier as the engineer that first suggested using the Hemi V8, to which he was promptly shut down by Fred. Don't get me wrong, James didn't live in his older brother's shadow in the least. If not for James, we might not have the Hemi as we know it today. James was one of the founding members of Chrysler's Engineering Institute formed in 1931. The Institute was Chrysler's way of hiring entry-level engineers. They would balance class and work and at the end of the program, you are a full-fledged Chrysler engineer with a master's degree to boot. But let's talk about Fred for a minute. In a nutshell, Fred Zeter was an engineer among engineers. Through his engineering prowess, he became chief engineer of Studebaker in 1914. He then brought in Owen Skelton and Carl Breer, where the three became a major engineering influence for Studebaker. They worked so well together that they became known as the Three Musketeers. In 1920, the Musketeers partnered up to form their own engineering company, Zeter Skelton Breer Engineering, and began consulting for other automotive companies, including Maxwell Motor Corporation and Studebaker Willys. In 1923, Walter P. Chrysler negotiated a four-year management deal with Maxwell and almost immediately asked the Three Musketeers to close their business to become the engineering arm for Mr. Chrysler, which they did. Then in 1925, the Maxwell Motor Corporation was dissolved and became the Chrysler Corporation. 
Over the years, the Musketeers revolutionized Chrysler into a top-notch automaker with many innovations to the credit, most notably rubber motor mounts. So by the time the 1940s rolled around, Fred was a big name in the automotive industry and I'm sure he was influential in getting his brother James to join Chrysler as an engineer himself. So getting back to James, as far as engineering was concerned, he was just as much an engineer's engineer as his older brother Fred. Remember, it was James' initial research into a hemispherical head that led to the Hemi V8. Well, his research didn't stop there, and in 1951, wrote a freelance article for Motor Trend about the hemispherical combustion chamber and its impact in the industry. In that article, his leader set the tone for Chrysler for years to come. He said that Chrysler's intention was to reinvent itself as an engineering and speed powerhouse, maximizing the Hemi's output by installing it in lighter, more dramatic looking cars. Then in 1952, James, now Vice President of Engineering, presented a white paper along with some of his engineering team to the Society of Automotive Engineers on the same subject. Well, word must have gotten out because Cedar was inundated with what he referred to as hot rod boys wanting to see just how much horsepower the firepower could make. So much so that many of them offered their own suggestions to which many were taken to heart by Zeter. When it comes to making horsepower, the new firepower operated just like any other internal combustion engine out there, so it responded well to your basic hot riding tricks. First, they experiment with the compression ratios of 7.5 to 1, 10 to 1, and 12.5 to 1, with every other aspect of the engine remaining unchanged. Obviously, the 12.5 to 1 compression ratio yielded the greatest gains, increasing horsepower to 193 with 330 pound feet of torque. The bad news is that the high compression ratio required 130 octane aviation fuel. Confident that they were headed in the right direction, Zeter's team applied every performance bolt-on mod that they could think of to their test engine, codenamed K310. Free-flowing exhaust manifolds, new intakes, larger valves, individual carbs, head porting, camshafts, you name it. They ended up with a Hemi powerhouse that cranked out 353 horsepower and 385 pound-feet of torque. James Zeter was very happy with the results of testing and reported that the basic firepower cylinder gives performance comparable with Indianapolis engines which have been developed for power without regard to any other purpose. He further concluded that we remain unalterably convinced that in the battle of the combustion chambers, the spherical segment chamber has demonstrated unquestionable supremacy. Armed with that newfound knowledge, Zeter had visions of competing in the Indy 500. I mean, imagine a company like Chrysler winning such a prestigious race. It was that aspiration that led to the development of the A311 project, the Indy engine. Fortunately, in 1951 for Chrysler, the AAA, or the American Automobile Association Contest Board, the sanctioning body that pretty much controlled Indy 500 racing back then, was looking for ways to get more people interested in racing Indy cars. At the time, the Offenhauser four-cylinder race engines pretty much dominated Indy car racing, but they were expensive to purchase, making it very difficult for the average Joe to compete. So, they allowed Detroit-built stock block V8s a chance to compete against the Offies. They also allowed an extra liter for the V8s, making the cubic inch limit of 335. The 331 firepower came in just under the wire. Fitted with all the go-fast goodies and topped off with a Hillborn mechanical fuel injection unit, Chrysler began developing the A311 to compete at Indy. They eventually ended up with a stock block firepower engine that ran on alcohol, producing over 400 horsepower at 5200 RPM. In 1952, Chrysler installed their new engine in a Curtis Kraft Indy Roadster and invited the AAA contest board to witness their testing session at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. With driver Joe Sestillo behind the wheel, he completed 
577 laps, averaging 134.35 miles an hour, a feat that destroyed the previous record of 128.922 miles an hour that was set earlier that year. So Steele was easily turning 137 mile an hour laps and topped out at 170 miles an hour on the straightaways. Numbers like this would surely dominate the 1953 Indy 500, sending the Offenhauser-powered cars packing. However, this success scared the AAA officials. This is unacceptable! So much so, they feared that if Chrysler were to win, the disenfranchised Offie drivers would exit IndyCar racing en masse, causing a major decrease in revenues. Not to mention, the overall public display of such performance got back to the Offenhauser teams and they lobbied for the AAA to do something. AAA immediately changed their ruling and disallowed the extra liter for V8s, limiting the displacement to 271 cubes. This caused Chrysler to go back to the drawing board to see if they could come up with about the same power with 60 less cubes. Unfortunately, what they came up with only generated a little more than 350 horsepower at 5,800 RPM, and it just wasn't enough to even qualify for the big race. Although Chrysler didn't qualify for the Indy 500, the Firestone Tire Company liked what they saw and wanted a similar car equipped with the original 331 Indy Hemi for tire testing. By the time the car was built and delivered, the A311 Hemi was producing 447 horsepower and could lap Chrysler's Chelsea Proving Grounds at over 180 miles an hour. All while Chrysler was trying to qualify for Indy, there was a privateer by the name of Briggs Cunningham who wanted to win at Le Mans with his own cars built by him in America. He struck up a deal with Chrysler and purchased the firepower engine at a discount. However, Chrysler offered no support. Any performance components were either created by Cunningham or supplied from an outside source. Although he never won at Le Mans, his best finish was fourth place driving his 1951 C4R, powered by a modified firepower producing 325 horsepower. As I always say, racing improves the breed. And it was through the efforts of racing that the firepower grew in power and size. In 1955, NASCAR racing was gaining in popularity and coming off of Lee Petty's Grand National Championship in 1954, Chrysler wanted an even bigger piece of the action. At that time, Chief Engineer Bob Roger proposed to build a car that was centered on the performance potential of the Hemi and could compete in NASCAR. So, working alongside styling chief Virgil Exner, they developed the 300 letter series, beginning with the C300. Now, the firepower already powered several Chrysler vehicles, but it was the 300 letter series that really showcased the true potential of the engine. With a base price of a hefty $4,100, the new C300 featured heavy duty suspension with a lowered ride height performance exhaust, wire wheels, and a plush interior. The new body design was the first of Chrysler's forward design, coming from Exner, and was referred to as the $100 million look because Chrysler spent $100 million on the car's development. It was so influential that it prompted Ford and GM to revamp their entire lines. Under the hood was the 331 Firepower Hemi V8 equipped with a solid lifter, long duration race cam, adjustable rocker shafts, eight and a half to one compression ratio, and dual quad Carter carburetors. The engine setup was good for 300 horsepower, way more than Corvette's 195 and the T-Bird's 198. Plus, it was even 30 more than Cadillac's 270 horsepower engine. When it came to naming the car, the 300 represented the 300 horsepower the engine made, while the C may have stood for Chrysler or perhaps the fact that the car is a two-door coupe. But the C300 was built to compete in NASCAR and compete is exactly what it did best. 
driver Tim Flock drove a C300 in the Flying Mile at Daytona Beach to the tune of 127.58 miles an hour on a two-way average, shattering the previous record by over seven miles an hour. The C300 went on to earn 18 victories and the Grand National Championship, pretty much the way they came off the showroom floor. On the streets, the C300 was a definite head turner and offered premium all-around performance, something that was generally reserved for two-seaters. In 1956, Chrysler introduced the 300B, which was pretty much a 55 C300 with a few styling changes, but the real news was once again under the hood with a new 354 cube firepower Hemi V8 that boasted 345 horsepower with an optional 355 horsepower version with a 10 to 1 compression ratio. The 354 featured an increased bore of 3.9375 inches while keeping the same 3.625 stroke. The 300B became the first American production car to produce one horsepower per cubic inch. With a new power plant and a new three-speed manual or optional torque flight automatic, the 300B set a new flying mile record at almost 140 miles an hour, all for a slightly increased price of $4,242. 1957 gave us a lot of great cars and Chrysler was no exception. Their new 300C was an all new design that was larger all the way around, including the engine. At 392 cubes, this was as large as the first generation Hemi would get. Standard power output was 375 horsepower with an optional 390 horsepower version. The new 392 engine came with an increased deck height of 10.87 inches over the 10.32 of the 331 and 354. Also, a 4 inch bore and 3.906 stroke. The taller deck height called for new head castings, ones that were a little thicker on the intake side to make up for the wider area on top. This would allow the continued use of the current intake manifold. The brand new styling was once again a Virgil Exner design that really set the tone for rear fins. Sharing its model line with the New Yorker, the 300C was offered in a coupe and convertible and features a new for 1957 torsion bar front suspension. The 300C was a hit on the streets as well as a track with a flying mile average of 145.7 miles an hour. It also won the NASCAR Grand National Championship for a third year, as well as the Women's National Speed Trial Championship. For 1958, Chrysler continued with the letter series by moving to the 300D. There were subtle styling changes with a slight increase in the base engine that now makes 380 horsepower. Some cars came equipped with a Bendix Electrojector fuel injection system. However, due to reliability problems, most were recalled and replaced with carburetors. As far as racing went in 1958, the 300D wasn't as fast as its predecessors. It could only manage 135 miles an hour in the flying mile. Unfortunately, due to the AMA agreement, Chrysler did not officially sponsor any racing teams that year, which affected the overall performance of the 300D. Check out what I said on the AMA agreement in the upper right hand corner. While it seemed like the firepower was going to go on forever, the execs were looking to replace it. It seemed as if Chrysler was backing away from the performance vehicles, plus the Hemi engine was expensive to produce and slow to build. The competition was producing tons of V8s with wedge style combustion chambers, much faster and cheaper, so it was time for Chrysler to develop a wedge engine program and come up with a Hemi replacement. What they came up with was the B-Series engine for the 1958 model year. These V8s ranged in displacement from 350 to 400 cubic inches and all shared a 9.98 inch deck height. In 1959, Chrysler developed another B-Series block with a raised 10.725 inch deck height, hence the RB engine, R standing for raised. They were produced alongside the B engines and handled the larger displacements, starting with 383 cubes. Next was the 413, 
then the 426, and finishing with the 440. For 1959, the 300E was the first letter series car to not be powered by a Hemi. Instead, the new 413 wedge engine sat under the hood in place of the venerable 392 Firepower Hemi. While the Firepower was killed in the 300 letter series, it was still offered for one final year in the Crown Imperial. DeSoto and Dodge had already stopped production of their Fire Dome and Red Ram engines, which had grown to 345 cubes and 325 cubes respectively. By 1960, the Hemi was no more. The Firepower had made quite an impact during its run of nine model years in various models, and I didn't even mention the many industrial and marine applications in which it was used. The hemispherical combustion chamber showed itself to be a superior design and proved its worth first in the skies, on the streets, and on the track. Thanks to the engineering prowess and persistence of James Zeter, the Firepower made it to production and it was the design genius of Virgil Exner who developed the 300 letter series cars that truly showcased the overall potential of a Hemi engine in a vehicle that was designed around it. It's because of their efforts that the public got a positive dose of a Hemi V8 engine that was mass produced for the streets. Even though it was canceled in favor of the cheaper to produce wedge engine, it would make a dramatic comeback four years later in an even more menacing form the form that would cement the Hemi as a household name, not only in America, but all over the world. Make way for the elephant. Stay tuned. <laughs>